In a dreaded journey home, Elliot Page plays Sam, a trans man returning to his family for the first time since transitioning. There are parallels to be drawn with Page's own life. In 2020, the star shared with the world his joy at being trans. The Oscar-nominated actor best known for the film Juno told me he drew upon his own experience when making Close to You with director Dominic Savage. Many LGBTQ plus people will be familiar with that sort of sense of dread or unease about being around certain family members. It is a lot of people's experience, unfortunately, those feelings of dread. I wish it was not. Um, and I think we wanted to get across maybe it's things that people don't understand uh, happen frequently and consistently to queer and trans people all the time, including within their families. I think we were trying to capture all the sort of nuanced ways of what it can feel like. And is it something you can relate to in your own life, kind of that slight unease in certain family situations or with certain groups of friends or? I, yes, absolutely. And I think, uh, you know, still being early on in, in my transition, of course, but like more used to it now. I think at first, when you first come out as trans, you're like, oh my God, you know, all these situations you find yourself in and maybe you just, I guess progressively kind of get used to it. Catherine? Hello. The film is set in small town Canada where a serendipitous encounter with Sam's first love also collides with a fraught family reunion. So nice to see you. There's a very powerful scene in the film where Sam's mum misgenders him. And actually, interestingly, he is kind of trying to make her feel more comfortable in that situation. I just wondered whether you think that's quite common for LGBTQ plus people. Very common. Yeah, <laughs> like if someone, you know, misgenders me and out of just, like, you can tell when something's like intentional and awful. There's another thing, like it's, it's, it's not a big deal, you know, it's, oh, sorry, fix it, you move on. It's really not. If someone keeps doing it consistently over and over again, you know, that's, that's a different conversation. And without wanting to sound like sort of couples therapy, how, how much sort of trust do you two have to have? Because I imagine it's a... It's a huge, you have well, to be quite... We did a lot of therapy. Did so. you do <laughs> I just felt that trust, mutual trust, from the, from the actual first moment we spoke. It was on a Zoom, and, and it was amazing. I think we felt innately we connected, and, and the trust comes from that, you know, and honest, being very honest always. With elections looming in the US, UK and around the world, Elliot Page tells me he's deeply uncomfortable with the politicisation of trans rights. There's a sort of culture war playing out in which trans people have been kind of put in the middle of, and I just wondered how you feel about that. When it comes to the devastating impact of um, what politicians and, and governments are doing and saying it's uh, uncomfortable is an understatement, um, it's actually... Uh, horrific and has like extremely devastating consequences for a community that already really struggles to just exist. Page's drama is among the often politically charged features at the BFI's Flair Film Festival, the largest celebration of queer cinema in Europe. Salut. Mainstream cinema has often been criticised for its overwhelmingly male gaze. Flair Festival offers an alternative lens with this new series, Split. It tells the story of a stunt woman having her first lesbian relationship. Its director, Iris Bray, wanted to move away from Hollywood's fixation with heterosexual love stories. Apart from the L word and a few exceptions, you don't often see lesbians falling in love on screen, really, in the mainstream. Yeah. Why do you think that is? I think that representing lesbians is a very political move still today. And I think it's a way to topple the patriarchy, to show that women um, can be happy together without men, that they don't need men to feel desired, that they don't need men to thrive. I think it's something that is still very political. And I think that's why we have so few uh, positive representations of what it means to fall in love with a woman. Do you think Brits are more uptight when it comes to that sort of thing? Because there's, there's a stereotype, right, that the French are much more open sexually, and I don't know if that's true. Whereas Brits, have you experienced in the British filmmaking world that we are more kind of closed? No, I think I think the stereotype actually is really wrong. I think that you, we see French people as being very liberated, but they're not. I think it's... Um, uh, I think f the French culture has shown one way of being liberated, and that is being submissive uh, for women. And 
I, I feel like TV series like Fleabag or Sex Education have done so much to just question what desire is, right? Just to open the door to, well, it's not maybe not that easy to access what you want, what you, uh, what turns you on to make it something that is complicated. Um, I think actually, for me, British television has done a lot more. This is where you get to see behind the curtain. Enter Layla. The film tells the joyful story of a British Palestinian drag queen living a double life as they juggle both their queer and Arab identity. It's something the film's director, Amru Al Qadi, has also grappled with. Is it autobiographical? You know, it's semi autobiographical. I mean, Layla as a character is sort of separate to me. And, but yes, I mean, it's definitely drawn from my own experience as a queer Arab trying to negotiate, you know, religion my family, falling in love. You know, Layla is a film about someone with so many conflicting identities, which is definitely something that I experience. Having come from a family that wasn't always accepting of my queerness, and then also being in queer spaces that might not always be accepting of Arab identity, you are kind of living in this tug of war with yourself. Um, and that's kind of what the film explores. So we're going to a sort of like an alien themed party. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you couldn't look more human. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you thought that was a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> it's giving very corporate realm and funny. Despite drag queens entering the mainstream in a massive way with the success of shows like RuPaul's Drag Race, in films, however, queens don't always take centre stage. Drag queens are often sort of the token or the sidekick or they're, you know, they're kind of on the periphery of mm -hmm. the main storyline. Why was it important for you to have Layla as, as the lead here? Yeah, I think that's completely right. I think a lot of the media representation of drag queens is quite superficial. They don't tend to have a sex life of their own or a rich emotional life. They have really funny one-liners or, you know, they're the best friend giving the advice to other people who are having sex. And one thing we wanted to see in Layla was, firstly, a drag queen be really sexual and have a great sex life and a rich romantic life. There's been a lot of talk about queer filmmakers kind of turning the cameras away from trauma narratives. We've had a lot of guilt, a lot of shame over the mm. years. Was that important for you to this, for this to be quite joyful? Totally. I mean, that was, you know, we kind of think the film is radically happy. Um, I think so much of the media narrative around queer people and also Arab people right now is all framed within the context of victims or villains and as a result it kind of feels like the world is just doing a lot of stuff to us but i think there's a lot of power in queer people and arab people taking autonomy over the narrative and doing it on their own terms the filmmakers at this year's flair festival are all redefining cinema in their own terms <laughs>